it's Jessie V. Happy Valentine's Day. Actually, my birthday as well. I am 27 and I'm currently wearing a heart monitor once again. I feel like I wear these every few months. Probably true. It's nothing to worry about. I have like an irregular heartbeat and so they like to check on me every once in a while, but I'll be okay. In today's video, we are continuing our series on missing kids that disappeared in a particular month. So this one is going to be about the month of February. And I like to preface this before I get into the video. All of these kids cases are from the 1900s to the mid 1900s mainly. I think there is one I'm going to be talking about that was in 2006, I believe. I like to talk about much older cases that have been closed that happened a long time ago. I always feel uncomfortable talking about anything super recent, especially if it's still being investigated. I want to be respectful to those families and victims. So yeah, without further ado, let's get right into this video. Oh wait, before I forget, we just got a new puppy. If you want to see him, head over to my Instagram, Jesse V, or head over to our V Vlogs channel. We're gonna be vlogging with him constantly. He's the cutest puppy ever. So if you wanna see him, go check out those two places. All right, so now let's get right into the video. This first case is about Esther Beck, and she went missing on February 2nd of 1923. Now she was 27 years old, so obviously she doesn't qualify as a kid, but her case was so interesting that I had to include it in this video. In December of 1922, Esther Beck was a nursing student at Indiana School of Nursing in Bloomington, Indiana. Apparently in 1923, Esther suffered this nervous breakdown while she was at school and she had to go home because of it. And it's actually very unclear as to what happened to her to cause her to have such an emotional reaction. And then on February 1st of 1923, Esther was living with her parents and around 4.30 p.m she told her father that she wanted to go on a walk. She also told him that she'd be having dinner at her sister's house. And she was last seen walking out of her parents' front door. On February 2nd, she hadn't returned home and her dad thought that she must have spent the night at her sister's house. When he realized she never made it there, he immediately called the police. And the search for her started right away. They even got the whole community involved in this. They walked far into the country, pretty much as far as they thought a woman would be able to travel on foot in the the blistering cold weather. And about five days into the search, they found her and it wasn't good. She was about 15 feet from the road and it appeared as though she tried to hop over a fence and had fallen. But what was strange was that one of her shoes was found right beside her and the other shoe was found way off in the distance along with her hat. Her death was definitely very mysterious. The whole community was very confused. Why was she trying to climb a large fence into a farmer's field, basically in the middle of nowhere. And what's even eerier is that several missing people have been found in that exact spot over the years. Now they found that no foul play was involved. She literally just fell over a fence, was not able to get up and froze in the snow. So why didn't she go to her sister's house? Why was she in the middle of nowhere? The whole thing was just very odd. The next case is for Andrew Sexton. He went missing on February 25th of 2006 and he was 21 years old at the time. Andrew Sexton was from St. Anthony in Newfoundland. He loved the outdoors and he knew the area very, very well. On February 26th, Andrew and his friends got onto their snowmobiles and planned a trip to a cabin in Goose Cove. It was only about a four mile trip and they had done this route so many times before. Like they knew the way perfectly. They left at 10 a.m. that day. They all arrived at the cabin shortly after but didn't stay long because they knew that a snowstorm was coming and they wanted to get home before then. So they all drove back on their separate snowmobiles. And when they arrived home, they realized that Andrew wasn't with them. So the police were called and that is when the search began. The snowstorm hit the area and it was pretty bad, making their search even harder. So they didn't find him on the first day, but on the second day, they actually found just his snowmobile, but he himself wasn't anywhere near it. What's strange is that the snowmobile was pointed in the wrong direction to get home. It still had a full tank of gas. The keys were in the ignition and it was operable. So the question was, where the heck was Andrew? The police eventually got these bloodhounds to look for him, but no clues were ever found. So the sad thing is, Andrew was never actually located even till this day. Some people in the area say he was abducted by aliens, which is obviously a little crazy. And this case was just so strange because Andrew knew Newfoundland, like the back of his hand. He knew all of the outdoors. He had been everywhere before. And the snowstorm hadn't really even begun while they were on on their way 
back home. The friends made it back perfectly, but he was not behind them. They even had divers search the frozen waters to see if maybe he had fallen in and there was nothing. People are just so confused as to why he would just leave his snowmobile there. The large vehicle is easy for people to locate, it's super warm, and it was still operational. So this case will always be a mystery. All right, the next case is about Jim Beveridge. He went missing on February 7th of 1981, and he was only nine years old. On February 7th of 1981, Jim was hiking a trail on the side of Mount Palomar with his two brothers. Jim was at the back of the group and somehow disappeared. The brothers tried to look for Jim, but couldn't find him anywhere. So they all ran back to their car and notified their parents. And they called the police, but as soon as they got there, it started pouring rain. He was last seen wearing a coat, tennis shoes, and long pants. The first day, they were unable to find him. And on the third day, they found his coat and one of his shoes high up on the mountain. Like an area on the mountain that would be extremely difficult for a child to climb. Like super steep rocks everywhere. And unfortunately, on the fifth day of the search, they found him on this steep side of the hill and he did not survive the cold. Now the coroner didn't find any foul play involved. They said that he literally just died of exhaustion. Now there are a couple of very strange things about this case. The first is that Jim's godfather actually went missing as well while he was looking for Jim. He was missing for the entire five days and when police found him, he was so tired, wet and hungry and he barely survived. The other strange thing is, why was Jim missing his clothing? Why would he remove his coat and his shoes? It was freezing outside, it was raining. And it's really eerie how many missing persons cases has this happen, where investigators will find their clothes way far somewhere else than where they find them. Now I have heard that when you have hypothermia, for some reason your brain tells you to take off your warm clothing. It's very strange, so that could have happened. Now there was also a seven year old girl named Jill that had the exact same thing happen to her in the same area of this mountain. It's always kind of unsettling when you hear about a similar case that happened in the same area. Lastly, we have a case about a boy named Guy Heckel. He went missing on February 3rd of 1973, and he was 11 years old at the time. Guy was spending the weekend with the Boy Scout group near Cedar Rapids, and on February 3rd at 8 p.m., Guy was playing capture the flag with the other boys. At one point, he himself had the flag, and he was running to find a position that he could hide. But when the scouts went to look for him, he couldn't be located. They all just returned to their tents and went to bed without telling any of the adults. And it wasn't until the troop leaders did a bed check later on and found out that he wasn't in his tent. So they called the police and they searched that night until 2.30 a.m. and didn't find him. 10 days went by with no sight of Guy or any clues as to where he would be. And at that point, one of the other Boy Scouts came forward with some very creepy information. He said that the three days leading up to Guy's disappearance, an unknown person would open the door to their tent and would shine a flashlight onto them and then would walk away. And it was never discovered who exactly was doing that. All of the troop leaders said they weren't. So it was almost like a stranger was checking on each tent with a flashlight, super eerie. Then on February 28th, they found Guy's jacket in a river about half a mile from the campsite. Now the strangest thing about this discovery was that the jacket was fully zipped up. It's not like he had removed it and thrown it on the ground somewhere. It was like someone removed it, fully zipped it up, and then put it in the river. Because obviously you can't get your coat off without like pulling the zipper down. To this day, Guy was never found, and it's actually scary how many kids have gone missing while at a girls or boy scout group, and also while playing games. It's so weird how that happens. Anyways guys, that is the end of today's video. If you want me to continue this series, definitely give this video a thumbs up and let me know, because obviously for March of next month, I can do one there as well. I do find these things very, very fascinating. Obviously though, it also breaks my heart reading each story, but I hope you guys find it interesting and I hope you have a really good Valentine's Day and I will see you guys very soon. Bye.